Okay, uh, so let's get started with antiderivatives. So before we start with antiderivatives, just quick, uh, just a quick recap on what we mean by a derivative. So given some function f of x, we can apply the derivative. So we can write it as d by dx. We can think of it as some operation we do on the function. From the function, we obtain the derivative of the function, which we call f prime. Okay, so going in that direction, we say that we take the derivative. Then we can do it again. We can have d by dx again, and we get f double prime. We can do this again and again, and we get a uh, chain of derivatives. So we have the function, the first derivative, the second derivative, and so on. Okay, so that's the process of taking the derivative. When we say antiderivative, what we want to do is reverse this process. So given some function, we now want to go in the opposite direction. We want to go this way. Okay, so I'm not going to put the notation for antiderivatives yet. Uh, we're going to do that later when we look at Riemann sums. Uh, but for now, we just want to work out what will this function be. Okay, and we can do this uh, like so. So we've got this forward direction taking the derivative. The backward direction, we're taking the antiderivative. Okay, so let's look at an example just to illustrate this. Okay, f of x is equal to x squared. Okay, very simple um, example here. So, this is the function. We don't want to take the derivative, we want to take the antiderivative. So what we want to do is to find a function, let's call it capital F. So we want to find a function call it capital F, such that if we differentiate this capital F function, we get back to the original. So you see we're working backwards with this. Okay. So we want to find this new function, capital F, such that if we take that derivative, we get back our original function. So here are we going backwards um, along here. Okay, so how do we do that? So I'll just show you the answer for now, and then we can work out uh, the general rule. So the answer will be f of x, capital F of x, is one-third x cubed. Okay, but we also have plus a constant, and we'll see why now. Okay, so why is this the antiderivative? Well, the reason this is the antiderivative is because if we take the derivative now, we get back to our original function. So let's try that out. So f prime will be d by dx of one third x cubed plus d by dx of c, which is just a constant. So now f prime d by dx of one-third x cubed. Uh, we use the power rule. So we take down the exponent, and then we minus one. Now, if we take down this exponent, the three and the one-third, that's going to make one. So we're going to end up with three over three, which is one, x, and then we minus one from the exponent. So we know how to do that. So that's three minus one, that's two. The derivative of a constant, that's going to always be zero. The 3 over 3, that just makes a 1, so we're left with x squared, which is our original function. So we have successfully found a function such that when we take the derivative, we get back to the original function. So we call this capital F of x the antiderivative. So capital F of x is the antiderivative of that little f of x. Okay, so what did we do to, to undo this derivative process? 
So when we're differentiating x to the n, we take the n down and then we minus 1. So we multiply by n and then we subtract 1 from the exponent. If we want to do the reverse process, we need to add 1 to the exponent and then divide. Okay. So just think about the forward direction. We multiply by n from the exponent and then subtract 1. If we undo that process, we need to add 1 to the exponent and then divide by the new exponent. So I'll write that here. So when we take the derivative, okay, x to the n becomes n x to the n minus 1. Okay, so that's our forward direction. When we take the antiderivative, Okay, x to the n will now become x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Right? That is the reverse process. Okay, so let's just check that this makes sense. If we take this antiderivative uh, x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, if we now differentiate that, so we take the derivative, what do we get? The exponent must come down. So the n plus 1 divided by the n plus 1, that gives 1. And then we minus 1 from the exponent. So that just gives us x to the n. Okay. Does everyone see that? Okay, who doesn't see that? Okay. So we call this the power rule for antiderivatives. So very similar to for derivatives, right? We have this exponent, uh, but please do not mix them up. So when we're taking the derivatives, we take the exponent down, we minus 1. When we take the antiderivative, we add 1 to the exponent and then divide. Okay. So like I mentioned earlier with your uh, double page in your notebook, on the one side you can put the power rule and how it works. On the other side you can put the power rule for antiderivatives and how it works, right? If you have it on separate pages, you can see that they're different. Okay. If you're just going to try to remember the two, you might mix them up. Okay. But if you have it neatly written down, you can see what the differences are. Okay. So that's just for uh, exponents. Okay. So let's look at another example. Okay. F of x equals 2x cubed plus 3x squared plus 1. Okay, something like this. Uh, we want to take the antiderivative. Now, similar to taking the derivative, we can look at each term separately and do the derivative. For this, we can do the same thing. We can look at each term individually and take the antiderivative. So, capital F of x... Okay, we're going to use the new rule that we found. We add 1 to the exponents and then divide. So here we have x cubed. If we add 1 to the exponents, it becomes x to the 4. So we divide by 4. So it will be 2 over 4, x to the 4. Plus. Now we have 3x squared. We add 1 to the exponent to make it a 3 and then divide. So it'll be 3 over 3, and then we've added 1, so it will be x cubed. Plus, now we just have a 1. Uh, anyone want to guess what that antiderivative will be? x. Good. Why would it be x? Because when we take the derivative of x, we get 1. So if we go in the other direction, the antiderivative of 1 must be x. Okay. And we're missing something. We need to put a plus c, right? So the antiderivative is not unique. So when we take the derivative of a function, we get back a function, right? Single function. When we take the antiderivative, we don't get back a single function. Instead, we get uh, what is called a family of functions. So this constant c can be anything, and it will still be an antiderivative. 
because when we take the derivative, the constant doesn't matter. It goes away. So the C, it could be a 1, it could be a 2, it could be a 3. All of those are antiderivatives. Okay. So instead of putting any constant down, uh, like an actual number, 2, 3, so on, we just put a C. And the C stands for any constant to add on. Okay. So here we get what is called a family of antiderivatives. So there's no single antiderivative that does the job. Uh, it's actually any of these just by changing C. So C can be any constant, and you get yourself another antiderivative. Okay, so it's very important that you add that plus C. Okay, um, now we can check if this is correct. Okay, so the nice thing about finding the antiderivative is you can always check your answer by taking the derivative. If the derivative matches the function that you're given, you know it's correct. If it doesn't match, something's gone wrong. So let's check. Okay, and I encourage you, please do the checking in your assessments. Okay, so when you get your answer for capital F, find the derivative and check that it's right. Okay, so let's just write it here. So I'll simplify it. So 1 half x to the 4 plus x cubed plus x plus c. Uh, let's take the derivative and see if that matches what we were given um, earlier. So f prime. We're going to take the 4 down. The 4 over 2, that makes it 2. So we end up with 2x cubed. We take the 3 down. That will be 3x squared. The derivative of x, that's 1. The derivative of c, that's going to be 0 because it's a constant. Uh, let's see if this, is ma if this matches. 2x cubed plus 3x squared plus 1. 2x cubed plus 3x squared plus 1. It matches, so we know 100% that that's correct. Yeah. So when you're, in your, uh, when you're doing your test and you see it matches, you guaranteed those marks. Yeah. So please always check your answer before moving on. Okay, it's very quick. One line just to check, and you know that you've got it right. Okay, uh, let's have a look at another example. Uh, I'll pick someone to answer this. So we have f of x is equal to 3x squared plus x to the 5 uh, plus 2x minus 1. Okay, so you're just going to do it uh, term by term. Okay, uh, who can I pick? Okay, you want to give it a go? Stand out in front. Okay, first term. What's that going to be? Okay, remember what the rule is. You add 1 to the exponent and then you divide. So if I have 3x squared, what's my new exponent going to be? 3. Okay, so the new exponent is 3. What happens when I divide by 3? Becomes 1. So 3 divided by 3, that's going to be a 1x cubed plus. Next one. What's my new exponent? 4. No, we're taking the antiderivative. We need to add 1 to the exponent. So it will be 6. Okay, so it will be x to the 6. Uh, what am I missing? Divide by 6. Next one. Yep, so it'll be 2, and then when I divide by 2, I get 1. Good, x squared. Okay, last one. Minus x, good. And last bit, plus c. Good, always remember your plus c. Okay, so that is my uh, antiderivative for that. Okay, so this pretty much handles all of the possible polynomials that you'll get. So whatever a x to the n you get, you always add 1 to the exponent to get n plus 1, and then you divide. And you do it just term by term. Okay, um, so that's polynomials. What about trig functions? Now, trig functions, uh, there's always some confusion with this. So when you take the derivative of sine, you get something... When you take the antiderivative of sine, you get something similar. 
there's always that room for a sign mistake. Okay, so sometimes there's a plus, sometimes there's a minus. Uh, please learn which one's which. Okay, so antiderivatives of trig functions. Okay, so we will start with uh, sine. So we'll take the derivative of sine, see what we get, and then we'll try to work out what the antiderivative should be. So number one, f of x equals sine of x. Okay, so what is the derivative of sine? Cosine, yeah. So here f prime is cos. Okay, so this is just looking at the derivatives. Then we have if it's cos, then the derivative will be minus sine. Good. Okay, now we want to use this information to go in the opposite direction. So let's just put this in a box. We're going to use this to find the antiderivatives. So let's say we're given sine of x. Okay, we want to find the antiderivative. So what we want to do is find some function that when we differentiate it, we get back to sine. So which function over here, when we take the derivative, we get sine? Okay, close. So here, cos, when we take the derivative, we get minus sine. So there's a little correction we need to make. The antiderivative of sine is not going to be cos. It's going to be minus cos. And remember the plus c. So that minus comes from here. Okay. So if we take this minus over to the other side, uh, then we get back the sine that we wanted. So here's f of x is equal to cos x. The derivative gives us minus sine, okay? but we don't want minus sine, we just want sine. So this minus here needs to go over to the cos. So the antiderivative of sine is minus cosine x, and then don't forget the plus c. Okay, let's look at the other one. Cos x. Now we want something where we take the derivative, we get back to cos. So if we were to take the derivative of which term, uh, which function, when do we get cos? Sine. Good. So I'm going to put a plus there so we know uh, which one's plus and which one's minus. Yeah. And you see how this is the opposite of derivatives. So the derivative of sine, that's cosine, the antiderivative of sine, that's minus cosine. You need to remember that there's a minus there. The derivative of cosine is minus sine, but the antiderivative of cosine is plus sine. You see there's the plus changes to a minus. Yeah. So um, with these two tables, please write them down so that you see the difference between derivatives and antiderivatives. Okay, uh, let's look at a few more trig functions. So let's say we had f of x is equal to sec squared x. Okay, so that's my function. Uh, what would the antiderivative be? Tan. tan. Good, because when we take the derivative of tan, we get sec squared. So when we take the antiderivative of sec squared, we go back to tan. It always goes back and forth like that. So this will be tan x, and then remember your plus c. Okay. Okay, so uh, there's a few more trig functions. Um, so I'll, I'll make a nice table so you can see what the derivatives and the antiderivatives are, uh, but they're fairly similar. Right, if you know all the derivatives, the simple antiderivatives, those are quite easy to find as well. Okay, uh, what happens if we have this? Uh, 
e to the 2x. Okay, if we take the derivative, we need to use the chain rule, and we get 2e to the 2x. Right? So whatever this constant was here, uh, we multiplied. Now, when we take the antiderivative, we know we need to do the opposite of whatever it was. Okay, so would anyone like to um, try this one out? So it's the opposite of what you would do for the derivative. Anyone? Okay, you still get points for trying, right? So you'll get points for trying, you'll get more points if it's correct. So you, you might as well try. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, you get all the points. Okay, uh, again, the points, just see me after, and then I'll take your name down. So one half e to the 2x, and then the plus c. Okay, so always remember plus c. Okay, uh, why is that correct? Well, we did the opposite, so it's correct, but we can test it, right? You can always check. If we take the derivative, this 2, that would be multiplied in front. But the 2 over the, 2 over 2, that makes 1, which is what we've got here. There's that 1 here. Okay, and then e to the 2x, that stays the same. Okay, so we know it's correct. So in general, if we have something like this, uh, e to the, let's say, kx, if we want to find the antiderivative, so it doesn't matter what the k is, it will be 1 over k, right? It's the opposite of what we would do for derivatives. So 1 over k, e to the kx, plus c. Okay. Uh, so you can do that in general. It doesn't matter what the k is, uh, you can always follow that rule. Okay, uh, what about this other function? Okay, so there's quite a few functions um, that you can just learn, right? They're pretty simple to, to just learn. Uh, and then later on, we'll go through more advanced methods of finding this. Okay, but this will be closer to the end of the semester. For these ones, it will just be simple rules that you need to follow. Okay, later on, it will get a bit more complicated. Okay, so f of x equals 1 over x. Okay, now this one causes quite a bit of issues because students write this as x to the minus 1, but then if you add 1 to the exponent, you get 0, then you try divide by 0, and then it's just a big problem. Right, so do not write this as x to the minus 1. The power rule does not work. Okay, so please make a note next to this function. The power rule does not work for this. Okay, we need to try something else. Now, we have actually done this before when we did the derivatives of inverse functions. Okay, so remember from before that the derivative of the natural log of x was 1 over x. Right, that was um, one of the first examples we did uh, a while back. So the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. Now we want to go the other way. We want to find the antiderivative of 1 over x. So that's going to be the natural log of x. Okay, so the antiderivative will be the natural log of x plus c. Yeah, so we used this fact uh, previously over here. Okay, so uh, sometimes you do need to know your derivatives of inverse functions uh, to find the antiderivatives. Okay, so if you know quite a few derivatives, finding the antiderivatives is just reading your table backwards. So if you know the derivative of tan is sec squared, then the, der then the antiderivative of sec squared is tan. You just read it backwards. Like here, the derivative of the natural log is 1 over x. So the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log. It always goes back and forth like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's do one more example. Okay, uh, what happens if I've got 
f of x equals 1 over x squared. Okay, so it's similar to 1 over x, since we have that negative exponent. Okay, so here the exponent was negative 1, but we had that, uh, that little uh, statement there that we can't use the power rule, right? Because if we add 1, the exponent becomes 0, and then we're dividing by 0. Okay, with this one, we don't have that issue. If we add 1 to this exponent, we get negative 1. And that's fine. We can divide by negative 1. So, whenever we have something like 1 over x squared, okay, we can rewrite this as x to the minus 2. Uh, and we're fine with doing this, right? There's no problems with that 0. Now, we just treat it as a normal exponent. Okay, so the exponent is minus 2. We carry on with the same method as before. We add 1 to the exponent to make it negative 1, and then we divide by negative 1. So, the antiderivative will be minus 1 times x to the minus 1. Okay? Uh, dividing by minus 1, timesing by minus 1, that, that's the same thing. So, this will be minus 1 over x. Okay, so if you want to write it back in this fraction form, that's fine. If you want to leave it in this exponent form, that's fine as well. Okay, so whenever you have functions like this, uh, where it's 1 over something to a power, you can always write it as x to the minus, whatever that exponent is, and then use the power rule uh, as you would normally work with. Okay. So the power rule, you can use it for uh, positive integers like x squared, x cubed. We did that already. You can do it for negative ones, except for minus one. Right? That's a special case. Uh, what about fractional exponents? Okay, so let's have a look at that. So uh, last example for this power rule. So f of x is equal to the square root of x. Now, uh, just written like this, we've got a bit of a problem. We don't have any rules for it. Okay, we know the power rule, but there's no exponents to work with. So what we need to do is write this as an exponent, and then once it's as an exponent, we can then use the, uh, the power rule. So this will be x to the one-half. Okay, just using our exponent rules. And we do the same thing. Okay. So if it's a, a positive integer exponent, negative integer exponent, or even a fractional exponent, the power rule still applies. So here, 1 half, we're going to add 1. So when we add 1, think of it as adding 2 over 2. Right, that's 1. So if I add 2 over 2, we're going to get 1 plus 2 over 2, so we're going to get 3 over 2. Now, when we divide by a fraction, that's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So, dividing by 3 over 2 is the same thing as multiplying by 2 over 3. So, here we can write our answer as 2 over 3 x to the 3 over 2, and we can leave it like that. You don't need to write it again with the root. Okay, and we're missing something. What's missing? plus c. Good. Okay, and as with all of the examples, you can always check your answer. So let's find the derivative and see what we get. So we're going to have two-thirds. That stays out in front. Now we multiply by the exponent. That's 3 over 2. And then we have x to the 3 over 2 minus 1. Okay, so I'm just using the normal derivative rules. So, 2 over 3 times 3 over 2, that's just a 1. And then we have x, 3 over 2 minus 1, that's the same thing as minusing 2 over 2. So we have 3 minus 2, that's going to be 1 over 2. And we can write that as a root. Okay, uh, so you see, we got back to what we started with, so we know that this is correct. Okay, so power rule... It works for positive integers, negative integers, except minus 1. Please remember that special case. It also works with fractional exponents.
Okay, so that covers uh, quite a lot of different cases. So if you just remember the power rule and those few trig functions, so uh, sec squared, uh, cos, sine, and those, are, uh, those few, okay, you should be fine. Okay, some things that are a little bit different. Again, you just need to remember this. We will go over the full rules later on, but for now, uh, it's just something to remember. Okay, so let's say f of x is equal to 1 over 1 plus x squared. Now, here, we can't use the power rule. We can't separate this out into two terms because we've got 1 plus x squared in the denominator. We can't split that up. That has to be a single fraction. So we can't split it up. We can't use the power rule. Um, we're kind of stuck. Yeah. But if we remember that the derivative of arctan is 1 over 1 plus x squared, Remember back when we did the derivative of inverse functions? If you remember that the derivative of arctan is 1 over 1 plus x squared, then the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared is arctan. Okay, it goes back and forth like that. So, recall, when we did the derivative of inverse functions, the derivative of arctan Okay, we did the whole process of changing it to implicit, take the derivative, we use the triangle, and so on. And then eventually, we got 1 over 1 plus x squared. So this is in that forward direction. The derivative of arctan is 1 over 1 plus x squared. If we go in the opposite direction, then the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared must be arctan. Okay. So you already know the answer. If you remember your derivative of inverses from before, then you already know the answer. There's nothing new to learn. Okay, you already know this from before. So here, the antiderivative uh, will be arctan of x, and remember your plus c. Okay, so there's nothing new there. You, you've all seen this one before. Um, and then along with this arctan, uh, we can have a similar thing for arc sine, arc cos, and so on. So here we can write uh, f of x is 1 over square root 1 minus x squared. Uh, we know how to handle that. Or if we had uh, f of x is 1 over, or minus 1 over square root 1 minus x squared. Uh, so this is different, right? We've got the minus there. But if we know the antiderivative of the first one, then the minus just goes out in front. Right? Like when you do the derivatives. If you have the derivative of ax squared, you can ignore the a, it's just a constant. Right? It goes outside of the derivative. Same thing here. If you've got this minus 1 in front, it just goes out. Okay, so this one I will put for homework. Okay, uh, so that's the first homework problem, and then I'll put a few more here. Uh, so let's put that as number one. Two, three, four, five. Uh, remember, the homework is compulsory, and you need to submit that. Uh, so I've got quite a few email submissions, um, so I have gone through that, and you have been checked off of the list as uh, submitted. Uh, if you do want to hand it in in person and you want me to go through it with you, you can just come to my office and we can go through it. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of students did not submit the homework, um, and those students will be getting zero for that. Okay, so here we have f of x is equal to... 3x to the 4 minus 2x plus sine x. f of x is equal to 3 sec squared x minus cos x plus x. Uh, 2x minus x squared over root x. Um, and then the last one root x plus sine x 
minus cos 2x plus 1. Okay, so just a few uh, warm-up problems to try. Okay, uh, so just five of them, and then they will be due, uh, let's say, Wednesday. Okay, uh, so uh, you can submit them today, you can submit them tomorrow, uh, or Wednesday during our double, uh, you can submit them then, uh, or you can come to my office if you have any questions, and we can work through it together. Right? So it's not you doing this alone. If you want to do it in uh, groups, that's fine as well. If you want to come to my office and do it with me, that's fine as well. Um, you know, as long as you're doing the work and getting the practice. Yeah. Okay, so that's going to be it for today. Uh, on Wednesday, we will continue with a few more problems. Then we'll go through some of the common mistakes for the test uh, that you did last Thursday. Um, and then we'll look at some of the tutorial questions. Okay, so remember that the tutorial questions, uh, they also need to be submitted. So at the end of the tutorial period on Thursday, the tutors will come around to collect your work. Okay, uh, just a note on that. The tutorial problems, they have to be written out and then handed to the tutors. For the homework problems, you can just email me or you can come to my office. Okay. But for the tutorials, please make sure they're written out so that you can hand it to the tutors. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so that will be done at the end of the tutorial. So the tutors will come around and collect your work. Okay. Uh, it doesn't all have to be completed. So at least uh, like three quarters of it. If you complete three quarters, then the tutors can check you off the list. Okay, if you've done half or less than half, then that's not going to count as a submission. Okay, so please do not argue with the tutors. Uh, they will just check and then tick you off. Okay, uh, if any of you have written homework submissions that you want to give to me, uh, you can do that now or you can do that in my office. Okay, okay so I'll see you on Wednesday. Uh, remember, that will be another double. Yeah. Okay. Question, yeah? Yeah, sure. Uh, 